once wrote a novel about a storytelling contest between the gods of the Taoist heaven. In the course of the story, you read both about the, the gods conducting their story contest. It was the male gods lined up against the female gods. But there were some traitors to both sides. And you also read about the story that they make, alternating from one side then to the next. And the story is full of all kinds of suffering. A young woman gets sold to be a servant, to get her parents out of debt. The young master of the house is a good person, but he dies off pretty quickly. He's got an evil brother. And all kinds of horrible things happen. There's floods, there's fires, suicides, lots of injustice. What makes for a good story? And then at the very end, Guan Yin appears and tells the Taoist gods, well, now that you've told this story, now you're going to have to go down and live it. And the last image of the, the novel is of the Taoist gods all falling out of the heaven down to earth. Because Guan Yin represents uh, what Buddhism did to China, brought in the teaching on karma. We're creating our lives. And even when the mind seems to be simply spinning its wheels, it's not just idly spinning its wheels. It's creating new states of being, new possibilities, some of which are good, some of which are not so good. You have to keep that principle always in mind as you're meditating. You're not simply here watching what's going on innocently without any responsibility for what's going on. You're responsible from your actions in the past and your actions in the present moment. On the one hand, this sounds a little onerous because nobody likes to take responsibility. Yet on the other hand, it's empowering. If you don't like the present moment, well, you can create a new present moment because there's lots of opportunities to come. You're not just a consumer of experiences, you're also a producer. We have to keep this principle in mind as we meditate, as we go through the practice. Our training in the precepts reminds us that you shape your life by the choices you make and what you do and what you say. The training in concentration teaches us that how you approach the present moment is going to make a big difference in how the moment is experienced. And you can develop skill in the way you focus on the breath, the way you adjust the breath, the way you develop sensitivity to what's going on in the body. These are all things you do as a producer of experiences, and you can learn to do them more and more skillfully. To create a sense of well-being in the present moment, even when there's pain in the body, even when there are other difficult issues in life, you can create a still center for yourself. You don't have to be a victim of what comes in from outside. You don't have to be a victim of whatever comes welling up from within the mind. You have a role right here, right now, in shaping things. And as we develop more mindfulness, develop more alertness, as our powers of concentration get more and more solid, we have the tools we need to make that present experience a lot more livable. The same principle holds true as we try to develop discernment. We're often told that discernment consists of seeing things as inconstant, and because they're inconstant they're stressful, and because they're stressful they're not self. Now if we take those teachings out of context, 
and just put them in our normal consuming mode. What does it seem to say? It seems to say, life is short, grab as much pleasure as you can. And since you can't grab at things too much, then you learn how to embrace them and then let go. So whatever experience comes, no matter how short or fleeting, you embrace it, try to develop as much appreciation, get the most enjoyment out of it, and then be quick to let go before it starts falling apart. But that's okay, because another experience will come along. In other words, the teaching seems to be telling us how to be expert connoisseurs in consuming our experiences. But at the same time, it leads not to only that misunderstanding, but other misunderstandings as well. You begin to think, well, if everything is impermanent, why spend all this time to develop concentration? Because it's all going to end someday anyhow. Why try to develop good qualities in the mind? Because it'll all come to nothing, eventually. But that's taking the teachings out of context. As I said last week, the Buddha taught the teachings of discernment. He started with questions of what's skillful, what's unskillful. What can I do that would lead to long-term happiness? That's the first question you're supposed to ask in order to develop discernment. And you look at your normal patterns of consumption, and you begin to realize that a lot of them are very unskillful. They lead to only short-term period types of happiness. And you realize it's not just the consumption, but it's what you do to produce these experiences. So you want to develop the skills that will make your happiness more solid, more long-lasting, less likely to turn on you and bite you. This is the type of discernment that underlies practice in the development in terms of virtue and concentration. You refrain from the activities that would lead to instant gratification, but then long-term regret, long-term remorse. You develop qualities of mind that create a sense of greater well-being that doesn't have to depend on outside stimuli, that can stand up against any kind of outside situation. Once you've developed these qualities, then you take the process of determining a little bit deeper. You use that principle of inconstancy to ask, is there anything that it's not in constant. Do I have to keep on producing, producing, producing for the rest of eternity? Isn't there a type of happiness that doesn't require that? So you turn and look more carefully at the, the type of happiness you're creating. And there's also the question of who's consuming it? What is this consumer? What is this producer? You begin to see that the consumer is also made up of khanas, which you have produced. And it's this insight that makes the whole process seem more and more futile. Why would you want to get involved in this, kind of this process? Even with long-term happiness, it's still not good enough. Your powers of sensitivity have been sharpened. Your insight into this process of production and consumption has gotten sharper as well. And when you finally reach the point where you see that it's not necessary, then you let go. It's easy enough as a consumer to continue to enjoy things that are inconstant as long as you've learned to mind your manners and how you embrace things. But as a producer, there comes a point when you get tired of producing. You've had enough. You see that all the effort that goes into it is simply not worth it. That's the insight that lets you drop things, that lets you let go. And it's in that context that the teachings on the three characteristics have their true meaning, play their true role. like the storytellers in the, in the novel.
we have to look at what we're creating, because we're going to have to live in what we create. You keep asking yourself, is this good enough? Am I satisfied with what I'm creating? Because it's not an easy task to stop creating. If it were easy, we wouldn't have to sit here and meditate so hard. It's difficult, and whether we like what we're creating or not, we keep on creating. That's the problem. So as long as you're going to create, you're going to create as good a world for yourself as you can, as good a world for the people around you as you can, until you've developed the qualities where you can look into this world production activity in your mind, this factory that keeps churning things out moment by moment by moment. To see if you can take it apart. It sounds a little scary, but then the Buddha promises that once you take these things apart, there comes a happiness that can't, that nothing that you created can ever compare to. It's that promise and the reality of that. uncreated, unfabricated level of happiness. That's what makes all this work we're doing here more than worthwhile.